All right, so we got some Arduinos and some Snap-on stuff and all kinds of things going on right now. And a big old book with stuff on it. So that means you know we mean business. So last time we left off was probably close to four months ago uh, when I was first trying to make progress on the um, TCU. So right now we're working with uh, a Renix uh, era Jeep, so it would be a 1987 to a 1990 uh, Jeep Cherokee, and this is obviously an automatic because it's a transmission and a transmission computer. So we are curious if we can get data out of the uh, AW4 transmission. Now I know that we can because my snap-on scanner can do it. So last time we left off, we uh, kind of got data, but it was really sketchy and kind of went in and out. And I kind of tried to make a, uh, a circuit based off what I knew from the uh, ECU, but uh, it didn't quite work and I wasn't sure what was going on. So, now we're going to uh, explore this a little farther and see if we can't crack the code. But anyway, if we come over to the Arduino, uh, I actually found out that there's a built-in um, thing that actually basically lets us turn our Arduino into an oscilloscope, which is sweet. Now usually what I do, over here we got a really basic uh, thing, we just have a, an analog read in and we serial print that. And um, usually if you go to serial monitor you can watch it so you can see these numbers and make an update and stuff like that so that's how I used to do it but it doesn't really show you a really good picture and when you set it really high it's a little easier to read you can see the patterns but um, there's another one in here that I found called serial plotter so if we click that it actually will plot what's on the serial so right now that looks like gibberish just because it's not grounded so let's take this guy, and when we pick it up, it actually does stuff. But what we'll do is we'll plug it into one of these guys, just because I'm uh, trying to check what's going on with these pins. So when we plug it in there, and we look at over here, look at that. You can actually see a waveform. That's friggin' sweet. So I did a little math, and this just divides it so it's 0 to 5. Usually it'll take up the whole screen, but it's a lot harder to read that way. But yeah, you can just see what's going on. I, I thought that was amazing. Uh, let's see, there's another one in here. It'll also pick up really small ones. So let's try this pin here. And if you look carefully, you can see it picks up little spikes too. And those are actually, it's sitting at like 3 volts or something and then goes down. So obviously you can't do any kind of like... Um, like crazy stuff like you could with a like an actual oscilloscope but just for basic testing just to get you by and give you a picture this is incredible <laughs> you basically have like a really cheap oscilloscope in your hands it's it's actually really cool so i just thought i'd show that it, it's helping me uh with my findings okay so after doing a lot of looking the only things that i found that actually look like data was uh this pin right here diagnostic pin 15 was the automatic trans uh tx pin that one looks like we have a, a nice waveform. Okay, so just to catch you guys up real quick, uh, this is the Renix Diagnostic Connector that we're working with. Um, so for our transmission, if we come down here to pin 15, you'll notice that says Automatic Trans Diagnosis, C4, and that goes to, um, the C4 is the TCU pin. So here's 15 right here, and then I'm pretty sure the only other thing we're going to need is ground, which is number 7. And this is for a 4.0, if you were curious. So now we're going to take our snap-on scanner and uh, jump it in and see if we can't intercept the data going to it. We got this all hooked up. We got all our lines, making sure they're not touching. We got that running over to our alligator clips into this connector so that we can adapt it over here. And this actually turns on. So I got a good feeling it'll actually work. Uh, yeah, oh, it does work, okay, cool. All right, so that is viable right there. So now the only thing I could do is maybe bring out the laptop and see if we can't read anything from the Arduino. Okay, so now we got our computer and we got our Arduino hooked up and we just have them uh, clamped on to our little pile of stuff over here. And look at what we see, we actually see data. At least that's what I think that is. I'm pretty sure that that's the highs and the lows. But that's cool. We can actually watch it. So you can see that it's um, it's not a perfect zero either. 
It's actually like one volt to like five. Something like that. And if we pause it, we can take a look at that. So, yeah, I guess that's something. Interesting. So I wonder if we can do that with the uh, the TX pin on the uh, transmission. And see if we get anything out of that. Okay, so now I uh, added a pin in there for the transmission out there in the back, that little tiny one. We switched the pin on this guy, so now it's feeding to the correct line as well. Don't forget that. So let's go yes. Um, let's go to other systems. Yeah, we're going to go to transmission. Yes, codes and data. Okay, and it's scanning. So now we're going to plug this in. And now this should work. Okay, cool. So that works. And if this comes alive, we may get something. First off, why is the baud different? We want this one. Oh yeah, I changed it to pause it. Derp, derp. Hey, hey, we got movement, baby. Oh god, that's dirty. Ew. It's almost like there's no ground reference or something. Look at how messy that is in between. If we just stop this real quick. Okay, what the hell. Oh, actually, that's that's not as bad as I thought it was. It's just going high, but it's nothing nothing crazy there. I don't know why the hell it's so small now. But isn't this cool? We have ourselves a little... Oh, that's why it was a gigantic spike. But we just have ourselves a little <laughs> Arduino oscilloscope now. Like, tell me that's not just, like, awesome. Yeah, some of these are, like, dropping way down to zero, but... That's cool, you can see everything. So you can see it's a, um, like a one to, I would guess that's close to five volt signal, maybe four and a half. Huh. So that's easy. That seems, seems simple enough. That's the voltages that are going on in there. Huh. The other thing that we can do now, I just disconnected the, uh, the snap-on scanner. So this is just the Arduino connected to that pin. And now look, we can still see our data. You just notice that the voltage is very low. We're talking very low. This is anywhere from probably like 0.3 volts to like maybe 0.8 volts. But it's all there. So if we just switch this real quick and pause, you can see it all. Oh my god, this is so freaking cool. <laughs> so there's definitely stuff there, so I guess we just gotta figure out if it needs a pull-up or what, what that takes to do that, but... Yeah, it's there. And technically we could, technically we could read it like this, but... I want to see what it takes to do it properly. Okay, so if you haven't seen any of the uh, previous videos, at one point uh, I went over the ECU and the TCU, just, you know, taking them apart and looking at the uh, circuit and all that. I didn't, don't know a whole lot about it, but you could take a look. Uh, and these were graciously traded by uh, Taylor for an REM, so big shout out to you for uh, helping me out, because without you it might have been a whole lot harder to figure this out. So, the way that I did this, First, I found myself a diagram so I could figure out what pin went where, so we could figure out which one was C4. But actually, I think it tells you on here, you can see 4 is somewhere over here. So this is the C side, so C4 is like that one. So you just come down here and find out where it is on the board. And you could try and trace it out by hand and all that, but I've got terrible memory, so I like to use computers. So I took a nice picture of it. And I brought it into Photoshop, and I started tracing it out. So if we come over here, here's our TX pin, and it goes through this resistor, and then it goes into this transistor down here, and then it goes places. So one of them goes to what looks like a ground, the other one goes to a uh, like a pull-up resistor bar, which is a 5 volt after that, and then the other one goes over to an inverting circuit, and that comes out of the, the main big... Uh, board over here. So basically this guy, this guy is sending out our signal, it gets inverted by this hex buffer, and uh, that goes into the transistor, and then the transistor does the stuff. And if we follow this down, um, so this is the base right here, and I forget which one's the emitter or the collector, but if you notice the output is going to the resistor, but it's also going down to another resistor, and then to a diode to ground, which is interesting. And that plays a big part in how this circuit's gonna work. 
So, um, in order to make this a little simpler, I just tried to sketch this out onto a piece of paper. So th this was the uh, the circuit right here. I just tried to trace it out on the paper so I could see what was going on. And then over here I tried to make it pretty. But basically this is the whole circuit right here. So we got our TX pin with a resistor. We got another resistor. And we got a diode and ground. So this tells us everything we need to know. This, this resistor bar right here pulls this line up so it's high. And what's happening is this hex inverter when this chip goes high, this is going low now, and that brings this low. So when this goes low, it stops feeding data. But basically, we have a resistor right in front, so we don't even have to have a pull-up resistor. All we got to do is feed 5 volts in here, and it does the rest. All right, so this resistor right here in between ground and the, um, the TX pin is the important part right here. So... When this right here is not flowing, all right. So when this base is clo uh, when this base is open, the signal can't go here. The only path it has to take is this high resistance to ground. So it'll just go in like that. Now what happens is when we get a signal over here and this base on this transistor opens, now instead of taking this high resistance path, it's going to go through the transistor and it's going to go to ground through this diode, just like that. So I guess that would be the difference, is uh, you'll get a high signal here, or if this is open, you'd get a low signal, I'm pretty sure, because it's sinking or something kind of like that. Now, how did I figure out the transistor? Usually the center's the base, and that really threw me off. Well, you can come down here and do a diode test. So on your multimeter, it has a diode mode, and uh, basically you have your positive on one side, and you put your negative on the other two, and you check the, uh, the readings. So over here we got a reading and a reading, so that's good. Over here we did not get a reading, so this definitely isn't it. And over here we got a reading, and I notice these ones are higher. This one makes the most sense for our circuit, so this is what it was. We found out that this was our base. If this was our base, it just it doesn't quite make sense. So yeah, that was the circuit right there. So once I finally drew it all out, it was a lot easier to visualize, and then we can figure out that it does all the hard work for us. There's, there's nothing left to do. So, screw it. Let's try pumping 5 volts in there and see what happens. Boy, Jeff. I think he's done it. So if we come into our sketch, it's rather simple. We got a serial goon, and we got a pin mode input, and uh, you know, just pull up right there. That's it. That's all we needed. We don't need no inverting transistors and bias resistors and all this other hoopla bullshit. All we need is a positive. That's it. Stick five volts in her and she's good to go. Who knew it could be so simple? So we come over here, yes, come far. And you'll notice the beautiful numbers streaming in there. Isn't that gorgeous? So yeah, that's pretty much it. So the reason why I'm using PuTTY is because uh, the Arduino serial monitor doesn't support uh, oddball readings like 500. <laughs> so yeah, I'm just running it through uh, PuTTY. But yeah, we got our stream and she's looking beautiful. So that's all it freaking took. So now we got good data. So that's sweet. So now I'll have to play with it and organize it and see what we can't do. But uh, we're getting there. We in the money, sonny. Okay, so we got everything hooked up over here. We got the Uno, and we got our logic analyzer. And um, just using the internal pull-up, I finally get to check this out. And look at that. These are beautifully clean. Look at it. Thank you. So there's no there's no glitches now or anything like I was having uh, issues before. They are uh, solid. The program picks it up perfectly. And uh, it just does freaking awesome so yeah that's cool you can see each little you know just stuff so I dig that that's that's sweet this thing's doing great <laughs> so I'm, I'm a little just mad about how stupid simple this was but it's good to see that this is a uh, very good data so that confirms we're not having any glitches or any weird things that it's picking up so now we can focus on trying to actually get the data so let's start this guy up and we got all our numbers Cool. Come over to this guy. We also got our numbers. Alright, so I think that is good. So now if we can organize the stuff, we might be doing something. 
Okay, so due to how small the thing is, I just created a, a fake sketch real quick to uh, output what I figured out. The delay of 190 helps give us that gap that the old one had. I don't know if that matters or not, but I figure I'll add it in there. So the circuit's like stupid simple because, well, it doesn't take much. Literally, we just have our TX and our ground go into uh, our logic analyzer. So over here, if we look at our readings, this is what the Arduino looks like. So you notice the uh, the bytes are really close together. Come over here. This is from the TCU. You'll notice that the bytes are split apart a lot more. Easy comparison over here on this last zero. So if we look at that, that's a 12 millisecond gap between those two digits. And over here, it's a 2 millisecond gap. So there's a whole 10 seconds removed out of each one. So it's just all around faster. But I did get the gap between the bytes the same. So we got 52 seconds over here all, and we've got 52 seconds over here all. So that might be enough to fake um, the snap-on scanner, but this will be an interesting test because we can play around with those gaps with delays and see if it looks for delays or if it looks for numbers. So we'll see what we find. So let's take a look here. Um, so I had to play with the um, the delays actually because the snap-on scanner does look for timing, not just the numbers because obviously I think all the numbers can change so you can't rely on that. So it did what I thought it was doing which was uh, time-based. So if we come in here um, after every number over here, so we'll write our first number and we'll have a delay. That delay is 30 milliseconds between uh, each uh, byte that is sent. And then at the very end, we have a 70 millisecond delay for the final gap. So if we come over here, this is the capture that I just took. So if we come in here, our end is 52.06, which is awesome. And if we look at our final gap over here, it's 12 milliseconds. So we've got 12 and 52. If we come down to the TCU output, we had 52.2 and 12.04. So we are like damn near right on the money. So that is a near perfect emulation of the TCU output. So now let's come into our setup over here. All. So we have our Uno outputting on the TX pin, just regular, no, no fancy, nothing or other. Got some stuff, so we are hooked up to the logic analyzer, and we got this jumper to the um, the snap-on scanner. So we're just running this off a 9-volt battery, believe it or not. So if you come over here, it actually successfully works, which is sweet. Because um, before I had those delays in there, it wouldn't detect it, so it is delay-based. So if we come in here, we can see 0, 0. Uh, and this is emulating uh, what my TCU is outputting. So... Yeah, well that looks good, awesome. So I'm gonna start playing through the numbers and see what changes, see what we can't map out. This is exciting. Now what we're gonna do is uh, run through every single uh, bike just to see what they all do. So we know that we have seven of them, so we'll start with, you know, like the first one. We'll start at zero, and then, you know, we'll, we'll write in like 255 since it's the max. So we'll see the high and the low, and first we're looking for what changes. So we'll run through the list, see what changes, and then we'll do the lowest number and the highest number to try to figure out the math or what it's good for. So if we come over here, here is some stuff. So here are the bytes right here. The first byte is just the module ID. It's just 0 to 255. It's, it's just whatever goes in comes out. Same with the TPS, but it only goes from 0 to 7. So these two are really simple. The next one's just the transmission RPM. So that one actually takes some uh, math. So if we check right here, when we type in 0, it says 0. When we type in 255, we get 8,670. Uh, 8, so all you do is divide 8,670 by 255 to figure out what the math is to recreate it. So if we take our number, the, the byte that we put in there, and multiply it by 34, we get our output. So that's pretty easy. Now next up, so the fourth one is uh, the brake switch, the park reverse neutral drive switch, and the mode switch. 
So these ones are interesting because they kind of just follow a pattern. So you have to type them all in and try to figure it out. So, for instance, let's look at the break. So this one right here, if the number is even, then it equals pressed. Or if it's odd, then it equals released. So that's not too bad. Next up is the Prindle switch. Now that one is a little interesting. So first off, right here, th this is the math that I figured out for it. All right, so first we divide it by 16 because that, that's the first group, all right? So if we check through this, so zero to 15, which is actually 16 numbers if you're counting zero as well, is a question mark, and then 16 to 31 is one to two, 32 to 47 is three, and so on. You, you, I, keep, uh, I keep writing down the pattern. So then we come down here and we figure out if we divide it by whatever, th this will technically equal zero, all right? So say we take 15 and we divide it by 16, that is not a full one. And this rounds down. So even if the decimal is 0.9, it's still technically equals zero. So then we just go through here and we, we add them all up. So because these things repeat. So see how the question is like zero and the question is four and stuff. So we come down here, the question was zero, four, eight, and twelve. Third year was this, 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 and that, blah, blah, blah. So we have our first set of repeating patterns set down. So now we're down to smaller numbers. And then what you do is figure out how we can break them apart so that we can read them. Well, if we take our number again and divide by four, then we can check the remainder. And that's the interesting thing about the uh, ma the mandulo or however that is pronounced, this percentage sign. It gives you the remainder back instead of uh, the division, which can be rather helpful. So right here, say we try to divide three by four, you get zero and remainder three. Same with seven. Divided by four, you get one, or remainder three. So that's how we're figuring this out. These all have remainder three, these all have remainder one, two, and so forth. So then you come over here, and you notice if we divide by 16, and we then mandulo by four, and our remainder is one, then it equals one, two, and so forth. So that one was rather interesting. The mode switch wasn't as complicated. So with this one, basically, if we divide it by 64 and it's I, and it's less than 128 its power, or if we divide it by 64 and it's even, and it's greater than 127 its comfort. Now the reason why there's two here is because the pattern isn't quite perfect. Over here we have 0 to 63 is um, comfort, and then 64 to 127 is power, which is great, okay. But then you'd expect it to be 128 to, uh, whatever the heck's in the middle of that, to be power, and then the last bit to be comfort. But it doesn't follow that pattern. It just goes comfort, power, comfort, comfort. So basically we just have to do a less than to filter out that power. Now next one up, the fifth one, is uh, all the solenoids and what current year it's in. So these ones weren't too bad. So if we come down to like solenoid one, this one is just if we divide it by 32, if it's odd, it's off, if it's even, it's on. And you can see the pattern that it was following underneath, so 0 to 31, 32 to 63, 64 to 95. So you divide it by 32, and then you break it down. Solenoid 2 was uh, every 64 numbers, and solenoid 3 was every 128 numbers, so that was rather easy. Now, the current gear one gets a little interesting. It's every 32nd byte, but we have to do more remainders to figure this one out. And this one also had a pattern that wasn't perfect. If we divide the number by 32, then group 6 is first, 0 and 4 is second, 1 and 5 is third, 3 and 7 is fourth, and 2 is question. So generally you would think that if it followed the pattern properly, this would be 6 and 2. And it should be, but I guess however the other combination of solenoids are together, if they're all on at that point, then it's not actually in a gear or something. So... First we divide it by 32 to get our first set of numbers, and then we divide it by 4 to get our remainder again. So remainder 2, no remainder, remainder 1, remainder 3. And then for the first and question mark we just have to do uh, if it's like less than or greater than a number. So that's pretty much it for that one. Uh, let's see, next on the list is solenoid errors and TPS errors. So the TPS error 
is really easy because there's only one. The solenoid errors took quite a lot of mapping to figure this all out. So 0 and 1 were nothing, 16 and 17 were nothing. Everything else had something. So basically I just had to go through one at a time. I just used a simple circuit where if I grounded a pin it would increase the variable by one and then I would just go through and count them all. Eventually I caught on to the pattern, but it was very strange. <laughs> I, I don't even want to bother trying to describe it. But that one byte could tell you whether three of these faults were stored and or if they were current as well. So there is a combination in here for every single outcome. So it was rather tricky to map it all out. I finally figured it out, but holy crap, it took forever. So yeah. Now that we have our bytes and we figured out what they all do, now we can start focusing on how to read in the data and uh, parse it properly so it can be framed for uh, the math. I think we're starting to get on to something, y'all. So, the um, I made a fake output, and it seems to mimic the TCU pretty well. I had to change the baud rate, because for some reason, um, using 300 as the baud rate, it would start to glitch after a while. The, um, the, f the reading Arduino would fill up uh, the serial buffer before it could like output them all, so it would fall behind, and then it would lose bytes and all kinds of weird stuff. So I'm just running at 9600 for right now. And... There doesn't seem to be any glitches with that, so I don't know. So we have our output TCU here, which is making our fake signal, and we have our input over here, which is reading the data. So um, I did some timing so that it looks for the byte that has the longer gap, and uh, it starts reading in seven bytes after that. So if we come over here to the serial monitor, and uh, let me just restart this so we know it's good. Restarted. So there it goes. See that? I'm going to take off this auto scroll. So if you come up here, you'll notice it read in a byte. It was only 20 seconds, 0, 20, like 30 seconds, 20 seconds. And then the next one, this one is usually 70 seconds, or milliseconds, I should say. So after that, that millisecond gap, it finds which one it is, and then it just reads in 7 and keeps doing that. And look at that. She tracks perfectly. That's what we want. So that's all it does, is it's coming over here and it's looking for a byte length of um, higher than 40. And if it finds that, then it can come down here and start the little deal. Reads in 7 bytes, fills up a uh, one of these guys, I forget what the heck they're called, and then it prints them. So that's Vita Gould. So now I just need to test it on the TCU and see uh, what kind of timing it needs to get that right. And that's the tricky part, because it has a baud of 500, which is weird. So I can't use the the built-in serial monitor. I'll have to use the uh, putty on the laptop. But this is exciting, so good times. Okay, so we're hooked up to the truck with some little um, stuff going on here. So if we uh, reset our little dealio here. Reset. Seems like it picks it up. So 30, 30, 70. So those numbers are right on the money. And then it does great for a little while. But uh, for some reason, it'll start to lose track pretty shortly. Yeah, there it goes. So for some reason, I don't know if something's filling up or what the problem is, but it's just everything starts to go out of order after a while. It's something to do with these um, slower baud rates. I don't know what the deal is, but man, it's a pain in the ass. It doesn't do that with the other baud rates, so... I'm going to figure out how to keep it from filling up. A little annoying, but at least we know we got good data, eh? Righteous. So sometimes when you're having issues, you really just got to sit and break it down to its bare components and keep messing around until you finally get an idea of what's going on. So uh, I was having issues with lower baud rates. For some reason, if I tried dropping the baud rate down to 500 or 300, I would start losing data and uh, the buffer would fill up really quick. And I couldn't figure out what the problem was. I was just messing around and I just I couldn't get it to do what I wanted to. And the higher baud rates, it was fine. Um, but one of the issues had to do with how I was sending the data, and the other had to do with how I was sending the data. So, let's, um, first I'll go over the circuit real quick. So we have our main Arduino Uno over here. This guy is outputting our stream. And this guy over here, a Metro Mini, is intercepting the stream, uh, for the computer. So it's basically just, that's a one way, just to see what's going on. And then down here we got our logic analyzer, so we can see what's going on behind the scenes. So we can make sure uh, that we're not missing something we should be. Alright, so as for the code, 
this over here is uh, our output. So what we have is uh, serial write commands. We're sending seven bytes with a delay. Uh, and then at the very end, we also have a delay. And this is to exactly mimic what the, um, the TCU outputs. Uh, because without delays, it doesn't work. Because this doesn't have a start byte and a stop byte. It's just, it just uses a, a longer pulse between frames. That's how you, you frame the data. And that is what threw me off, is those delays. We'll go over that in a minute. Uh, now, uh, for the receiving side. I had all this crazy stuff, but eventually I broke it down into something a lot simpler. So we just had a, a regular serial dump. That's all it was. We start up with um, our serial begin, and if serial is available, we read it, and we print it. That's it. Nothing, nothing else, no other this, that, or the other thing. Um, and doing it just like this, it actually works. We, we don't have any issues, at least at 500. I didn't check 300. We might not. So, first off, we're just going to cut to the chase. The top row is the Arduino Uno outputting the original stuff. Alright, so this up here is the Uno, and this one down here is the Metro Mini. So, here is our signal. We have our 7 bytes, and then you notice the longer pause between frames. Uh, which is about 50 milliseconds. That's what we want because that's what the TCU outputs. Now, when you tell it to serial print on the Arduino, it uh, uh, it has to print a lot of other things in order for the uh, serial monitor to pick it up uh, properly. So if you notice, none of these numbers really seem to make sense. It's all random and stuff. I don't know if I need to put a different filter on it to analyze it, but there's a lot of uh, extra overhead when you use serial.print. And I didn't know that. So when I had about five or six different serial.print commands, um, you know, I was just running out of bandwidth. It couldn't keep up anymore. So eventually I would start losing data. Now, if we go to our serial.write, this is what you would expect. So right here, this is the raw stuff. This is still the Uno output. And this is the Metro Mini, uh, what it's outputting to the computer. So if you notice, it's an exact duplicate, but there's no delays. So there's a lot more space, a lot more bandwidth, and it doesn't fall on its face. We're not losing data. So that's that's what was getting me. I didn't realize all that extra bandwidth that was required for serial.print. Because if you go in here and you try to, I mean, it's not even going to work properly because it's not the right baud rate, but you just get these icons. You don't get the numbers. The numbers, Mason. What do they mean? So, you know, when I came down here and I had um, all this other stuff, you know, print spaces, print the byte length, print the serial dot available, all that, that was all extra overhead that was thrown it all, you know, off the charts. So I didn't know that. So, now we know. This is why it's nice to have a, um, a logic analyzer so you can really see what's going on behind the scenes. So now that I know the baud rate isn't the problem, I should be able to continue and hopefully make some good progress on this. Alright, so why did this affect uh, lower baud rates, but not higher baud rates? Well, I guess I could show you. So, let's make a new capture, and let's set it to 9600, because I knew that that wasn't a problem. So we'll do 9600 for both of these. Okay, so now we'll come over to our analyzer. Um, let's move this over to a new tab. Okay, and let's begin. All right, so we're gonna get a bunch of garbage because we gotta reset our um, we gotta reset our baud rate over here. I could set it to auto baud if I wanted to, but eh. Okay, so now that we come over here, you'll notice that the uh, bandwidth is very free. So if we come over here, you know, you'll notice that this this one little byte over here is like damn near nothing. So I'll show you this one since there's some details. You can see that, you know, now those little tiny delays that look tiny are huge in comparison. And now this serial print command, even though there's a lot going on, it's got plenty of time to do what it needs to so it can keep up and you never lose data. So that was the issue as well. Is since I was using, you know, hard stop delays to get the length that I needed, when I started messing with the baud rates, it also messed with other things and, well, you get the picture. So yeah, that was kind of my goof, but now you know. Okay, 
So I guess it's a good thing I put some breakout pins on this board. It's proving to be quite useful. Since we got our ground, 5 volt, and battery positive if we want, and the other Ethernet jacks, it makes this simple work. I should put some header pins on it though, just to make it a little cleaner, but... I think you'll recognize this pattern a lot. And check this out. Oops. If I push the, uh, the gas pedal. Look at that. Our TPS reading moves. Ain't that snazzy, huh? We're connected. If we come over and change our, uh, our power comfort switch. Hey. Look at that, huh? We're in, baby. We're in. Oh my god. So I think I finally figured out the code. And uh, it seems to pick up pretty well because I added a special LCD clear. So if we lose signal, um, it'll clear the uh, display. If we add it back in, uh, picks it right back up. <laughs> That's incredible. Oh my god, I feel like a goddamn genius right now. Oh, I'd love to drive it right now, but it's not sturdy. Maybe if I do some uh, hard connections, maybe, maybe, I'll see if I can get it to work on the uh, the monitor, huh? Hmm? Let's see what happens. Okay, so here we are with a, uh, a modified uh, Alpha Renix Engine monitor. And the modification consists of a wire going from A3 over to pin, I think it is, 1 of the Ethernet jack. That's the one that I had hooked up on my adapter. And, um... I have the same code running as I did on the Uno, but I wasn't getting anything. And when I went over to the test setup that I had, and I hooked it up, everything worked fine. So what I did was, I hooked up the Uno, I, I piggybacked the Uno off of this setup, and then the Uno wasn't working. So this is a, a good answer to my question of whether, whether you should use an internal or external pull-up resistor. I think the internal pull-up resistors are somewhere around like 30k or something. And that's great for short distances, but over long distances, it's not enough power to do what you need. So this is where the external comes in. The The recommended um, ohms for an external pull-up is anywhere from 1k to 4.7k. So I got me a, uh, a 1k ohmy over here. And I'm going to run that from our 5 volt over to our pin A3 and uh, then we'll see if we get anything. So with our resistor sitting on the pin we have data. Would you freaking look at that? And she's working. That's the TPS right there. So that's all it was. You know little things like that will totally bug you up and <laughs> it's like alright what's going on? I worked on the bench but it's not working outside. Well, that 10-foot Ethernet cord is all it takes between an internal and external pull-up for not working. So, sweet! Alright, so we're taking ourselves a little Jenny. Okay, so we can see our TPS on the right just kind of hanging in there. It's only a value 1 through 7. We can see released as the brake. If I hit the brake, it says pressed. Now for the RPM, the left is the uh, transmission RPM and the right is the uh, speed. Now that's just a quick calculation for gear ratio. Uh, I'm going to have to add a little bit of a correction, but probably not much. It's damn near perfect for what the gauge is showing. I don't know what the... Um, I'd have to compare with GPS to see how accurate it is, but it reads the gauge almost perfectly. So that's cool. I guess I know what I'm doing there. Give it a little more TPS. Now we're into two. Now the only thing I notice is that the uh, the RPM reading uh, will not read anything faster than like five miles per hour. Slowly come to a step. See how it just drops out. Alright, so this is what it looks like with a little bit of formatting. Looks a little cleaner, doesn't it? Um, so some of these are actual gauges and other of them, and, and some of them uh, are more like lights where they just come on and off. For instance, if I hit the brake, you notice the brake comes on. And when it's not on, it's not on. Uh, we also have our TPS over there. 
And if you notice, if I, if I push it all the way, we actually get an error. That's the TPS error over there. So it thinks it's like overextended or something. Um, so let's see what else can we do here. So if we shift it, um, this should actually be park, reverse neutral drive, but I took the park out just so that it fit a little cleaner. So now I'm in drive. If I put it into third, sometimes it doesn't activate. But if I pers put it into first, second, you see how it like jumped for a second? I think that the contacts on my the contacts on my neutral safety switch are a little burned out or something. So if I go from first, second, back into third now, now it'll register properly. So that's interesting. But we put it back into a drive and then, you know, that stuff. Uh, the other two spots after the one would obviously be, you know, that's solenoid one. The one after that would be solenoid two. The one after that's solenoid three. And they would, you know, show up when they work. Uh, the P is for the power comfort switch. So if I come back here and I flick that, it goes into comfort and power. And then the, uh, the numbers over here are... Um, the error code IDs. So the first one is for solenoids, and the second one is for a throttle position sensor. So there you go. That's actually pretty clean. I think that this is every single bit of info that the TCU puts out, besides like the module ID, which is just the number one and never changes, so it's not really useful anyway. But yeah, that's pretty solid right there. It shows you everything you need to know. All right, so here we are with the formatted version. Oh, look, nice and pretty. Sorry, it's shaky. Left-hander. So there you have it. Sorry if I broke your brain, but uh, it took quite a lot of effort to figure this bad boy out. And look, now we can adjust for our tire size, our gear ratio, and even a mile per hour correction so you can get it spot on. So yeah, that's everything with the TPS update. And uh, you know, if you guys want to update your REMs, I have a video on how to uh, upgrade it to the AW4 version. I get a video on how to update the code and you know, videos on everything. And if you want to follow the rest of the project or just see little bits and pieces here and there, I got a whole playlist for you guys. So I know not a ton of people are interested, but the few nerds out there that are interested, this is a mother load of information. And I know someone out here is going to find it cool as hell. So I figure I'll share it with the world. I'm sure someone eventually will want to learn something about their AW4 transmission. So Thanks for watching. Stay tuned for uh, more exciting stuff with this project. It's been a huge learning experience. Oh my goodness. Talk about Electronica 101. Oof.